Namaste, and welcome to our continuing series, Essays on the Gita, with our beloved Ranga. We are in the chapter, Man and the Battle of Life. It is page 54 in the latest edition, beginning with the sentence, but there comes also a stage. In the previous para, he has discussed the the three modes of nature, sattva, rajas, tamas. And that's very relevant because Arjuna's first reaction is in the ignorance. He is using his um, mind, life and body. He is identified with them and he is um, affected by what he sees. But Sri Krishna is telling him, not to be affected by what he sees and that is possible only when you rise to a higher level in the self and then your consciousness is actually released from the body-mind life and there is a dislocation between the your consciousness and the body-mind life. Therefore, the impressions of the impacts of the world on your body-mind life do not affect the consciousness at all. They affect the body-mind life but not you. You are up watching calmly, quietly, and that's what Sri Krishna is telling him to do. So, at which level are you? Arjuna is at the lower level. He has to get rid of his tamasic quality, rajasic quality, and sattvic quality, and rise and become what the Gita calls Trigunatita, above the three gunas, above the three modes of nature. So, that's what he's discussed. So, now we will read the but he's also using his morality. Yeah. Morality he's, is a mind-constructed r- set of rules mm-hmm. which are not absolutely valid for all the levels, but they are certainly valid for the man who is in the ignorance. He certainly, when he is identified with the body-mind life, what we like to call level one, in the ignorance, you are identified with your body-mind life, you see the many forms in the physical world and consider them to be real, then you are in the ignorance, you are in level one. But it is possible for the consciousness to rise out of your body-mind life, you lose your identification with body-mind life, your consciousness realizes that you are a part of the eternal and you have always existed and you will always exist in the future. You realize your immortality. But the body and life are only instruments given to you for one particular life. Once that life is over, these instruments are dissolved and then you take rebirth and take new body, new life, new mind, which may have absolutely nothing to do with the previous one. In one life you may be tall, another life you may be short. And one life you may be born in South America, another life you may be born in in Siberia, you did absolutely no guarantee of what. But as the soul develops, the soul develops also a certain will and a purpose of its own. When it is sufficiently well developed, it can choose conditions for its next life. Okay, so that is what Sri Krishna is going to tell Arjuna: Don't be the normal man who is identified with body mind life and subject to sorrow and pleasure and pain and suffering. Rise above and do the bidding that is given to you by the Divine. Is there always a progress from life to life? Yes, it may be very, very slow, but there is. Because when the soul comes out, it has a fast review of one's life. And this is one of the characteristics of the, when you come out of your body, there are enough research has been done nowadays, in a near-death experience and there are f- about 10 to 15 things that happen to everybody but not all those things happen. One of them is you see your own body lying there. You are outside and you see your own body lying there. The other is you enter into a, a space of absolute calm and peace. That's the second thing. That is universal. Then you feel yourself being plummeting through a tunnel Then the other thing is, you also review your own life and you see whether there is anything that you would have liked to change. And this is very interesting because this review of life can happen 
even a little before death on the point of death also this review can happen mm. it's very interesting we are going a little out of the text but it's really very interesting i'll give you an example of what happened in pondicherry the person to whom it happened does not know this principle but i could understand from what she is saying okay they used to live on the sea shore on the kurchikopam area and in when did that tsunami happen in uh, that huge mm-hmm. tsunami in uh, in uh, indonesia when 8 uh, years 9 years ago 2007 ha huh? 2007 okay so that time this wave the, it came right up to pondicherry mm-hmm. in fact the waves came into kurchikopam and reportedly there were about 100 people who were affected i think they died many of them died yes many yeah. of them but this lady she was also there she and her husband and the water was rising 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 and she doesn't swimming she went to the first floor but even there the water is rising she had the experience of reviewing her own life and she is saying is there anything that i would have liked to have changed in my life that's nothing but a review okay but she doesn't know that this happens to everybody who is going out of the body so this happened to her even before she is going out of the body so this one of the things that happens is a review and there is a naturally the consequence is a small progress not a very big one but it's a small progress thank so you it does happen yes there is a progress but that progress is so slow that they say that to come to the human level to take a human birth it takes about 100000 lives 1 lakh yeah i've heard that yes yeah 1 lakh of lives 1 lakh to come to the human level yes a human level <laughs> okay that's why uh, shankara in one of his uh, works he says that nara janma durlabh that means the birth in a man's uh, consciousness is not easy it's very difficult so it can come only after 100000 before that you may have been an animal you may have been lower plant animals and the consciousness is going on evolving from the lower forms to the higher forms until finally you are ready for a a human life <coughs> but even the human life sometimes is not um uh, a very developed consciousness it can be uh, it there can be infant mortality that's one thing that is possible then also there can be an undeveloped state <laughs> okay we know many are undeveloped states okay almost like an animal that also can happen so that has that means birth after birth yeah, again yeah that's right you have to yes. take again one more birth one more birth mm-hmm. until you are able to the soul is able to tolerate the human condition <laughs> it's not <laughs> okay so now let's read Thank the you. so yes. <laughs> So Sri Ram has described the sattva rajas tamas conditions, and he has told us what in the previous para. Now <clears throat> I'll read the whole para first. But there comes also a stage in which the mind recoils from the whole problem, and dissatisfied with the solutions given by the threefold mode of nature, trigunya, seeks for some higher solution outside of it, or else. above it it looks for an escape either into something which is outside and void of all qualities and therefore of all activity or in something which is superior to the three qualities and master of them and therefore at once capable of action and unaffected undominated by its own action in the nirguna or the trigunatita it aspires to an absolute peace and unconditioned existence or to a dominant calm and superior existence the natural movement of the former attitude is towards the renunciation of the world sanyasa <coughs> of the latter towards superiority to the claims of the lower nature and its whirl of actions and reactions and its principle of is equality and the inner renunciation of passion and desire the former 
is the first impulse of Arjuna, recoiling from the calamitous culmination of all his heroic activity in the great cataclysm of battle and massacre, Kurukshetra. Losing his whole past principle of action, inaction and the rejection of life and its claims seem to him the only issue. But it is to an inner superiority and not to the physical renunciation of life and action that he is called by the voice of the divine teacher. So, we will go into a little detail. <coughs> you remember Arjuna's when he tells the he is full of vigor and he is full of to ready for battle because he is a Kshatriya. He enjoys the challenge of a battle. So, they use the word holiday of a fight for a, a very heroic one who enjoys the challenge of war. It's a it's a holiday for him. He enjoys what he's doing. Okay, so he goes with that attitude and tells Sri Krishna, "Please place my chariot between the two enemies so that I can see whom I have to fight." And then Sri Krishna takes the chariot, places it in between the two armies, and <clears throat> this is also interesting. The not like modern warfare in the ancient days, at least in India, to a certain extent in other countries also. War was a very regulated activity. At sunrise, a bugle is to be blown and the war starts. Then you start fighting, not helter-skelter throughout the night or anything. And at after sunset, a bugle is blown again and the war has to end. No more killing. It is absolutely regulated. Modern warfare is not like that. And also, it is a battle between the Kshatriyas on both sides. The normal people are not involved in it. Today, nowadays, it's not like that. Everybody has to go uh, undergo conscription. They have to get military training in most of the countries. Not in, in India, no, because there are enough poor people who want to join the army. So, there is no conscription in India. And we are 1.4 billion people. So, <laughs> there is no shortage of volunteers. But incidentally, I am going a little out, but it's interesting news that in China, they have a huge army. But the army is not willing to fight. Their training is quite different. Okay? In India, the army is trained very well to fight for your country. And your role is to protect your country. So they are given a very detailed uh, psychological um, grinding. They are made to understand that life is nothing. The life of the nation is more important. So in China, it's not like that. They are unwilling to fight. This is the latest uh, thing that comes. So they are forced to fight. And if they don't, they want to, then they are punished. <laughs> That's beside the point. But what I'm saying is that war was a very well regulated thing. And in the in even in Mahabharata, there are incidents where once the bugle is blown for the war to end, the, the enemies would meet and talk like friends. <laughs> okay. So it was altogether a different thing. It's a war without hatred and without fighting for a principle. That is how it used to be. So, Sri Krishna, is, his chariot is taken and what does he see? He sees in front of him his great-grandfather, his uncles, his cousins, his best friends, all these are arranged against him. His own half-brother, Karna. So, he says, impossible. How can I kill my own people? I refuse to fight. And his reaction is one, that's why Tamas has been described. He hands start trembling, the bow falls from his hand, he feels feverish, his body is trembling and he sits down and says, I will not fight. This is the reaction of the normal man who is subject to pity and not compassion, but weakness of the vital. You can't bear to see something violent. <laughs> this is something that happens to many people. And when they see blood, they faint. <laughs> Many, they can't bear the sight of something horrific. So, this is Arjuna's condition. So, he, and he thinks he is doing something very nice. He is being very virtuous. He is refusing to kill. <laughs> and Sri Krishna tells him, this is no heroism. This is a weakness in your nerves. 
this is a bodily weakness and a vital weakness shake off this cowardice and stand up and fight and do what the divine is telling you to do <laughs> so this is the advice but you can't do that when you are identified with your body mind life in ignorance your consciousness has to rise to a level where you are not affected by the sattva rajas tamas not affected by the impacts of the world on your body your vital and your mind <laughs> so that's what is gita is all about rise to another level of consciousness and obey the dictates of the lord and not your own mind or your own vital that is the gist of the gita so we read each sentence now okay all right <clears throat> but there comes also a stage in which the mind recoils from the whole problem and dissatisfied with the solutions given by the threefold mood of nature trigunya seeks for some higher solution outside of it or else above it so the normal man he adjusts himself to his whether he is tamasic okay he meets the um, the impacts of the world with a little bit of laziness and he accepts okay i just read out the uh, relevant portion dominated by tamas man does not so much meet the rush rush and shock of the world energies whirling about him and converging upon him as he succumbs to them he becomes a, a victim of the forces coming in okay if he is insulted he is hurt but he keeps quiet doesn't do anything succumbs he is overborne by them if suffering comes he doesn't try to fight it he just succumbs okay afflicted subjected or at the most helped by the other qualities the tamasic man seeks only somehow to survive to subsist so long as he may to shelter himself in the fortress of his established routine of thought and action okay so just to protect himself but the rajasic man the one who lives in the vital will face the problems of the world and try to conquer them okay arjuna is not doing that <laughs> okay arjuna is succumbing <laughs> to the so i read that portion also because it's relevant dominated by rajas so what is rajas it's a characteristic of the vital energy movement power desire wanting to achieve things okay you are driven by ambition even that also is part of the rajas and how is he tamasic he is not tamasic who arjuna oh he is at this particular time ah. he is affected by what he sees okay he is normally a kshatriya and his dharma is he should stand up and fight but when he sees this what he has to face he is now living in the 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 vital also can get depressed na and that's what is happening <laughs> the tamasic man the tamasic rajasic man he was rajasic and i by the way you don't need to be only one type throughout your life one day you can be tamasic one day you can be rajasic okay and a touch of the sattva also can come in sometimes this is a everybody's experience sometimes you feel lazy <laughs> you are tamasic sometimes you feel full of energy <laughs> okay so it is not that it is a permanent state it depends on the day circumstances and everything so then dominated by rajas man flings himself into the battle and attempts to use the struggle of forces for his own egoistic benefit i won't read further but this is what he tries he tries to slay conquer dominate enjoy this is the principle of the rajas so this is what has happened to him he he has fallen a prey to the impacts of the physical world he refuses to fight okay so <clears throat> now sir me is saying there comes also a stage in which the mind recoils from the whole problem okay the problem of what to do sometimes when you are faced with something you are either weak reaction or a strong reaction at every level there are positives and negatives so to get rid of the problem the ascetic says i don't want to have anything to do with the world he recoils from the world that's what sir me is saying the mind recoils from the whole problem and dissatisfied 
with the solutions given by the three fold mode of nature three fold mode of nature your body mind life or your tamas rajas sattva they can't give you a satisfactory solution to your problem and what is your problem the sufferings of the world the impacts of the world all these are always not giving you happiness na no? so seeks for some higher solution outside of it or else above it so the one who is not satisfied with the normal conditions in life tries to find a solution outside the normal life goes away to the mountain or the cave runs away from the problem or else above it this is a, a spiritual solution above you go to the self you rise and go to the self okay it looks for an escape either into something which is outside and void of all qualities and therefore of all activity or in something which is superior to the three qualities and master of them and therefore at once capable of action and unaffected undominated by its own action in the nirguna or the trigunatita so even when you are seeking for a spiritual solution there are two things one is i just escape from the problems of the body mind life i am not suffering anymore your consciousness rises to the self and you are a witness and you are calm and peaceful no power you don't do anything you have escaped from the body mind life the body mind life will continue to have pleasure pain suffering everything will be there but you are not affected because the dislocation between the soul and the body mind life has occurred so it's like someone else is suffering i am not suffering okay there is an interesting sonnet of sir amdos the ego okay so <laughs> so shrem the written it in a very uh, humorous way but that is the uh, truth of the experience the man says he is free okay he says i am free and i am very peaceful then he starts swearing when his dinner is not ready <laughs> then <laughs> shrem the asks him shrem the means that's the way the, it is put in the sonnet are you sure that you are free Then why are you shouting? He says, "I am not shouting. It's the stomach that is shouting." <laughs> It's put in a very uh, ironical way, yeah. but that's exactly what happens. You are quite satisfied. The body mind life will go on with its old actions and old habits, but you are free. I am free. I am not shouting for dinner. It's the body mind life that is doing that. <laughs> so this is the first spiritual solution. It's a spiritual solution. but that's the ego still no it's not the ego it's the self ah okay this ego is still down there <laughs> yeah okay but you have dislocated yourself but the stomach is shouting huh? the huh? stomach is shouting yes that's right the stomach fights and the and mind he's, continues and he's looking at it yeah from above you are just watching from yes, above that's it. the condition of the self in buddhism you call it nirvana okay but shrimdo says you may not be satisfied with that you may want to change even the lower so these are the two things that he is talking about okay first is trigunatita seeks for some higher solution outside of it or else above it it looks for an escape either into something which is outside and void of all qualities and therefore of all activity or in something which is superior to the three qualities and master of them so the first is you are escaping you have no power of the body mind life you are at peace you are satisfied that's a normal liberation but you may not be satisfied with that you want to be master of your body mind life you are not satisfied only with peace and calm that's the second one and that's what shrimdo wants shrimdo wants you to be master of your body mind life not just a negative peace and calm it should be a positive peace ananda and power that should be there okay undominated by its own action in the nirguna or the triguna okay so there are two solutions spiritual solutions it aspires to an absolute peace and unconditioned existence now what is the unconditioned existence when you are subject to your body mind life and you are identified with your body mind life at the level 1 you are conditioned your soul is 
chains are put on it you are conditioned by the body you are conditioned by the vital you are conditioned by the mind you are imprisoned but unconditioned existence you are free of the prison of body vital and mind you are out your consciousness is out you are just watching your body mind life from above it's a consciousness that's the main thing and that goes up you can equate in a certain sense consciousness and soul you can say that they are the same there are some philosophers who say no soul has a consciousness but you can say also that soul is consciousness okay it depends on how you look at it <laughs> so unconditioned existence you are in the nirguna but shivanda wants you to be also in the saguna you want you you must have capacity even in the physical world you must be master of yourself <laughs> okay so or to a dominant calm and superior existence so first is the unconditioned existence only a negative peace and the second is a dominant calm and superior existence you have power also over the lower the power can start even at level 2 and it can become absolutely perfect at level 3 in the super mind but super mind is not easy to reach so a little bit of power can come even in the spiritual planes of consciousness have many in the ashram reached at least the super mind not many bit? perhaps but uh, a few niruddha is uh, no not niruddha sorry uh, nolini nolini is supposed to have yes lived mostly in the over mind plane and sometimes it is reported even in the super mind <laughs> i don't know of anybody else who has done that the records don't show it <laughs> but nolida yes some have reached uh, uh, very high levels of consciousness um, but the records are not very clear two or three of them definitely okay many have experienced the self the unconditioned existence yes many there is a very interesting uh, incident niruddha is asking what is the brahman consciousness to serve though so shrimda explains to him what the brahman consciousness is okay it's a consciousness which is absolutely unconditioned you are not identified with your body mind life you are in a condition where you are free there is peace you are not subject to the sufferings and the pleasures and all the impacts of the world you are absolutely free and immutable you are in a silence of action and thought and emotion nothing you are absolutely above all these things so then he asks him though can you whisper to me the name of some sadhak sir reached this condition and <laughs> 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 so he says no <laughs> but later on we came to know because the records are there in the archives okay there used to be a gentleman he is a uh, his name was manodhar and what was his work he used to cut he was a he used to cut hair in the ashram such a so we think that only those who are doing very great work and all okay they are but no not like that at all there was another gentleman also uh, his name was gangadharan and his work was looking after the sanitary workers in the ashram and he also reached a very high plane of consciousness because the records are there in one of the magazines his experiences were given so yes there have been half a dozen people who have experienced all these things but uh, some of the names are very clear but not all <laughs> take for instance dilip kumar roy mm-hmm. who was so uh, served the new him in ancient greece and so all these long letters are all addressed to him but he couldn't accept the mother he had to go away <laughs> yeah look at amal okay too 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 active in the mind too active <laughs> he had the experience of the psychic but not the self i think i've told you once i asked him i said amal have you been able to silence your mind and he says he used to stammer a little bit but not when he's reading poetry when he's reading poetry no stammering at all absolutely perfect reading but otherwise he used to stammer he has written a beautiful poem also on his stammer he compares his stammering to the flickering of stars beautiful 
Okay. So anyway, he was a poet. So I asked him, have you silenced your mind? He says, no, I have not silenced my mind, but I can silence other people's minds. <laughs> <laughs> I said, how? He says, by argument. <laughs> 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 so even Amal, who is such a, supposed to be a great yogi, yeah. he could not silence his mind. <laughs> but he had psychic opening. That he had. <laughs> Let's get back to our text. Good. So, the one who is Trigunathita, that means who loses his identification with body, mind, life, becomes superior to body, mind, life, enters into a condition, spiritual condition, which can be twofold. One, a negative peace. Peace without power and maybe also without ananda. Maybe a very mild happiness, but not rapturous ananda may not be there okay <laughs> that may not be there but it is enough they are more than satisfied with this i am free i am liberated i am not a prisoner anymore of my body mind life so that is one experience but the other experience which Shri is saying you want to be master not merely a powerless peace it should be a condition where you are master and not only a negative peace so that's what is being described here. Okay. So, the natural movement of the former attitude is towards a renunciation of the world, sannyasa. If you want only liberation, you renounce the world. You don't want the world. You give up interest in food, in clothes, in friendships, in money, all these things you give up. Neither wife, nor child, nor anything. You give up the whole thing. There is a sannyasa. Of the latter towards the superiority to the claims of the lower nature. The one who wants to be master, he also resorts to sannyasa, renunciation. But what? Renunciation of the world? No. Renunciation of the desire in the mind, attachment and ego. He cuts the link with desire, with desire, with attachment and ego inside him. So he continues to live in the physical world and is master of them. So that's what Srivanda wants. <laughs> so it can be twofold. Both are spiritual. One is a lesser spiritual condition, the other is a more powerful spiritual condition. That's what he is discussing in the para. Okay? So, the former is the first impulse of Arjuna recoiling from the calamitous culmination of all his heroic activity in the great cataclysm of battle and massacre, Kurukshetra. So, Arjuna, who is identified with his body, mind, life, he wants to renounce his work. That's the normal reaction of man when he is disgusted with the imperfections and the problems in the world. He wants to give up. The same they saying he should take the solution of the spiritual solution. He should go out of his body, mind, life and obey the divine. Okay, so <clears throat> losing his whole past principle of action, what is Arjuna's whole past principle of action? Kshatriya, warrior, warriorhood, bravery, okay, inaction and the rejection of life and its claims seem to him the only issue. Renounce all these things, don't face all these problems. If I if I don't if I don't have to battle, I just withdraw from it. But it is to an inner superiority and not to the physical renunciation of life and action that he is called by the voice of the divine teacher. <laughs> That's why in the Gita there is a distinction between Tyaga and Sanyasa. Sanyasa is giving up the physical world. Tyaga is the cutting of the link. I may be mixing up the two words, but they mean the same thing. But one is a giving up of the physical world and the other is a renunciation of inner renunciation, cutting the link in your own being with desire, ego and attachment. Then you are free. You don't need to leave the world. That's a Gita solution also. That's what he is saying in the para. We can read the next one? Yes. We have got two more paras for the chapter. Arjuna is a Kshatriya, the Rajasic man 
who governs his rajasic action by a high sattvic ideal so to begin with a kshatriya is a high sattvic ideal he lives in the vital and is and the, that's the uh, characteristic of the kshatriya he faces the challenges of life and meets them bravely <coughs> okay there yeah. is a rajasic man who governs his rajya section by high sattvic sattvic ideal it's a combination of rajas and sattva <coughs> he advances to this gigantic struggle to this kurukshetra with the full acceptance of the joy of battle as to a holiday of fight but with a proud confidence in the righteousness of his cause this is his first he is approached to the to the his his uh, duty of war he advances in his rapid chariot tearing the hearts of his enemies with the victorious clamor of his war conch so even the the conch that they blow okay all these people they had conches and before starting the war these conches are blown and the war starts and each one there is a name to each one's war war uh, conch <laughs> each one all of them <laughs> righteous because it becomes symbolic <laughs> the conch that each one is blowing has a name <laughs> he advances in his rapid chariot tearing the hearts of his enemies with the victorious clamor of his war conch for he wishes to look upon all these kings of men who have come here to champion against him the cause of unrighteousness and establish as a rule of life the disregard of law justice and truth which they would replace by the rule of a selfish and arrogant egoism they are the kauravas who are ranged against him okay when this confidence is shattered within him when he is smitten down from his customary attitude and mental basis of life it is by the uprush of the tamasic quality into the rajasic man inducing a recoil of astonishment grief horror dismay dejection bewilderment of the mind and the war of reason reason starts war within him should i do my satriya um, duty or should i not the war of reason against itself a collapse towards the principle of ignorance and inertia so from his rajasic quality he is falling down into the tamasic quality <laughs> as a result he turns towards renunciation so better to not to be a kshatriya not under these conditions anyway better the life of the mendicant living upon arms than this dharma of the kshatriya this battle and action culminating in indiscriminating massacre this principle of mastery and glory and power which can only be won by destruction and bloodshed this conquest of blood stained enjoyments this vindication of justice and right by the means which contradicts all righteousness and this affirmation of the social law by war which destroys in its process and result all that constitutes society so this war is going to destroy society and it will have many many pernicious results so i won't fight this is the his condition he is a man of rajasic quality but he falls when he sees the challenge he has to face this happens with everybody at some time or other your values get you have there is a confusion in the mind and you don't know whether to do or not to do it challenges you all your values <laughs> you are leading a very 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 happy life family life is very very pleasant and very nice suddenly someone very dear to you passes away i have seen many many examples in life okay one very recently one young girl lost her grandmother or grandfather i don't remember now was very highly disturbed completely didn't know what to do for several days 
completely gone another man he was also having a successful business in pondicherry itself and he made a gave a loan to a friend quite a large sum that man cheated him he didn't give him the money completely broke down so these are the problems that can arrive in life all your established rules of life happiness get shattered at one blow then you are confused just like arjuna <laughs> okay so this is what he is saying so now shri krishna has to advise him and tell him that don't think this is a virtuous action he thinks that he is doing something good he is recoiling from a crime how can i kill my own people but he tells him that this is cowardice this is not because you have a function in the world and you are running away from your function face the challenges and do what has been told to you not by your mind but by the divine now he is discussing the sanyasa okay sanyasa is a renunciation of life and action and of the three fold modes of nature but it has to be approached through one or other of the three qualities you can give up the world but it can be tamasic it can be rajasic it can be sattvic he will explain how okay the impulse may be tamasic you may want to run away from the physical world but it could be tamasic a feeling of impotence fear aversion disgust horror of the world and life you see all these things and you feel yourself to be powerless to do anything you withdraw i won't take part in life's normal activities i am a defeatist i i i am defeated by the circumstances this is the tamasic withdrawal <laughs> fear aversion disgust horror of the world and life or it may be a rajasic quality tending towards tamas so it's a combination of rajas and tamas an impulse of weariness of the struggle grief disappointment refusal to accept any longer this vain turmoil of activity with its pains and eternal discontent this also you will see very often in life if you are very observant that there are some people who plunge into an activity with great vigor but in a very short time they realize that this is, this is not there and they give up okay they fail <laughs> i have a very interesting example of this one <laughs> there was a gentleman uh, at the end of the uh, our holiday uh, in school uh, the, the school ends in end of october november one month we practice for the second december and first december and then the holidays go up to the 15th of december so during those holidays the children go out for picnics and for outings so sometimes they go walking right up to jinji which is about 60 70 kilometers from here they go walking it takes two nights so this boy was told that we are going walking will you come oh yes i'll do it <laughs> great enthusiasm rajesh equality he goes up to jipmar <laughs> and he realizes that he can't do it <laughs> collapses and says i now realize is a one big mistake <laughs> so that was samasik quality so this is what can often happen in life <laughs> okay so the impulse may be tamasic feeling of importance fear aversion disgust horror of the world and life or it may be a rajasic quality tending towards tamas an impulse of weariness of the struggle grief disappointment refusal to accept any longer this vain turmoil of activity with its pains and its eternal discontent you get discouraged and you give up the effort okay <laughs> i remember in one activity when mother said once you start something okay you must not give it up it's a defeat of the will she wrote it was a particular department okay it was the now that no, all those people are not concerned they are all gone i can speak of it it was the uh, ashram photography okay and we used to get we used to hold exhibitions from all over the world thousand pictures used to come 
one thousand pictures from all over the world, and we used to have an exhibition. We used to select only hundred pictures and exhibit them in the exhibition hall, the best ones. And ninety percent used to get rejected. Okay, so, <coughs> but it became more and more difficult because all the pictures had to be sent back. The postage started becoming very heavy. The packing became very heavy. Money was short. So it was decided that better stop the activity. Mother wrote back and said, "It's a defeat of the will. You should have continued." Okay. The same thing happened with Mother India. Mother India also, uh, in the beginning, it was being supported by uh, the society. Amal was the editor. And he started in Bombay, but when it came here, um, somehow the situation changed, and he was told to pay the bill to the press. So he wrote to mother, and mother said, "You must pay the bill." She said, "You must pay." But he was—we all know that he was a very vitalistic man, very vital man. He was intellectual, but very vital also. He took up the challenge. And he started paying the ashram bills. <laughs> so sometimes you meet with the Rajasik quality, but sometimes you don't. You are defeated. That's what is being described. Or the impulse may be that of Rajas tending towards Sattva. Okay. So the impulse to arrive at something superior to anything life can give, to conquer a higher state, to trample down life itself. Under the feet of an inner strength, which seeks to break all bonds and transcend all limits, or it may be sattvic, an intellectual perception of the vanity of life and the absence of any real goal or justification for this ever-cycling world existence, or else a spiritual perception of the timeless, infinite, silent, nameless, and formless peace beyond. So all these things are possible. You can be defeatist. You can take up the challenge and face life and try to master them, or you can understand that the physical world is full of suffering and pain, and you understand it and try to go above it. Try to stand stoicism. You try to bear the shocks of life and go above. All the spiritual solution. The last one is a spiritual solution. You go outside your body, mind, life, and you are not affected by the conditions in the physical world. You go to an unconditioned existence. Okay, so the recoil of Arjuna is a tamasic recoil from action of the sattva rajasic man. So he began life as a sattva rajasic man, the kshatriya, but he. Got depressed and he fell into the tamasic quality. That's what said this. The teacher may confirm it in his direction, using it as a dark entry to the purity and peace of the ascetic life. So what is really saying here? The teacher may confirm it in its direction. He can say to somebody, "Yes, yes, you are right." Okay. You are right. Go away from the physical world. That also is possible. It depends on the man, but not someone who is starting with the uh, shatriya attitude. Okay. So the teacher may confirm it, may confirm it, may agree with it in its direction, using it as a dark entry to the purity and peace of the ascetic life, or he may purify it at 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 once and raise it towards a rare. Altitudes of the sattvic tendency of renunciation. So you can also renounce, but not in a disturbed condition. In fact, he does neither. Sri Krishna does neither. He tells him to rise, and he doesn't say that. Oh, you are doing very good. You are being very moral. No, he doesn't say that. He says, get up and rise to a higher level of consciousness. He discourages the tamasic recoil and the tendency. to renunciation and enjoins the continuance of action and even of the same fierce and terrible action but he points the disciple towards another and inner renunciation not the renunciation of physical renunciation of the world inner renunciation which is the real issue from his crisis and the way towards the soul's superiority to the world nature and yet 
its calm and self-possessed action in the world. Cut the link with the world in yourself. Get rid of desire, ego, attachment and continue to act in the physical world without being affected by the world. Not a physical asceticism, but an inner ascesis is the teaching of the Gita. Don't run away from the physical world, but cut the links in the mind which will make you suffer or enjoy. Get rid of all this. Cut the link in the mind. Make the dislocation from the physical world in yourself. Don't be affected by these things. And that can be done only by getting rid of attachment, ego and desire. <laughs> so that is what Sri Krishna is telling Arjuna. But Arjuna accepts, that's later, Arjuna accepts, says, you are my guru and I accept you. But tell me, how can this be possible? What is the nature of a man who has been able to make this and pick up Trigunatita? How does he speak? How does he act? Is there any sign by which I can know that this man is in a higher consciousness? So Sri Krishna answers, no. There is no such sign outwardly. But the signs are all inwards. And then the whole Gita tells you about Samatha, about Dhyana Yoga, about Bhakti Yoga, about Karma Yoga. So that is the Gita. 800 verses <laughs> as a small portion of in the Mahabharata. And all this is taking place in the middle of the battlefield. <laughs> if you read the Gita from beginning to end non-stop, it takes two hours. Okay. Gita Parayana is done all over India. They do continuously reading. Uh, they do it sometimes in relays. Okay. Somebody will read one chapter, somebody else will read another chapter. So, uh, so it happens very often. So, it takes two hours. But so, they do Savitri also. Yeah, yeah, they do that like for Savitri that. also. That's right. <laughs> and that we should have a discussion one day. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ranga. Okay. Namaste all. <laughs>